Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you so much for coming. So I'm Eyal Dweck, and uh, I'm a product manager in Starkware for the past three years. I'm very excited to be here today, my first time in Seoul. And today I'm going to talk to you about StarCat Native Smart Accounts, also known as Account Obstruction, and why this is a real difference in the blockchain UX. I'll take my clicker. OK, so I'm going to start with the following question. Why are people scared of blockchain? And I've been searching Google for this question, and what I got was this answer. That's the most common answer. People just don't understand it. And I'm saying, why do they need to understand it? Do they understand the entire banking system? So basically, what we want is the users to have the same user experience that they are used to. So they won't be scared, and they wouldn't need to ask, what is this new technology? This is the agenda for today. So first, I'm going to explain what is account obstruction. And then I'm going to convince you that this is a game changer. You bet it is. And then we're going to go a bit into the technical details. I'm going to show you two different implementations of account obstruction. The first one is done by Ethereum, also called uh, EAP 4337. And then I'm going to talk to you about what we did in StarkNet with native smart accounts and why we chose to do it like this. And finally, I'm going to show you three real world applications that exist today and implemented on StarkX and use StarkNet native, native smart accounts. OK, so first, account abstraction. In order to understand what is account obstruction, we need to first understand what was before account obstruction. So Ethereum traditionally had two types of accounts. The first one is EOA, externally owned account. For this account, you need to have a key pair. And you must sign each transaction using your private key with a very specific Ethereum signature scheme. This account can send transactions to the network. On the other hand, you have the smart contracts. That's a different kind of account. You can have any general logic uh, coded into it, but this account cannot initiate transaction. So we have this limitation. If we want to have both general logic and to initiate transaction, we can't do it with one account with the existing, existing scheme. OK, so I'm going to show you two examples of uh, problems that, um, that uh, their cause is this lack of uh, general computation in EOAs. First of all, who in the audience ever used a seed phrase? Thank you, Sam. <laughs> yeah, some people have used it. And you see their worried faces. Why is that? Because you get this seed phrase, it's a 12 or 24 word seed phrase, and you write it on a note, and then you keep thinking, what am I going to do with it? On the one hand, I don't want to lose it because then I'm going to lose control over my funds. But I don't want anyone else to see it as well because if someone will have my seed phrase, they will be able to steal all my funds. So people choose this very silly solution where they just tuck the seed phrase under the mattress, like we used to do a few hundred years ago with our money before we had banks. And we don't want to move a few hundred years back. We want to move forward, right? We want a better experience. Another limitation that exists is subscription payments. So let's say that Alice has an account, uh, has a subscription to Netflix, and she's paying each month. But now Alice is going to the mountains. She wants to travel, and she doesn't have internet connection. And now she can't pay her Netflix subscription. But she really wants to get home and binge her favorite TV show, Emily in Paris. So since she doesn't have an internet connection, she can't pay. And then Netflix cancels her subscription. And when she gets back home, she won't be able to see the TV show. And that's unfortunate for Alice, right? 
So we saw all these limitations we have, and there are other problems with EOAs. And what I'm saying today is that we have a rescue, and to the rescue, we have account obstruction. And the account obstruction offers a few main features. The first one is that you can use different signature schemes. You don't have to use the Ethereum signature anymore. So, for example, this can solve the seed phrase problem that we saw before. Another thing you can do is pay fees with a different token, not necessarily the Ether token. And it also enables atomic multi-call, which is very useful for DeFi operations, for example, where you need to do um, allow, first give permissions, give allowance to an ERC-20 contract, and then do swapping, for example. You can also have different replay attack prevention schemes, so you don't have to use the sequential nonce that uh, is the traditional way in Ethereum. And you can have any general logic, for example, recurring payments for Netflix. So let's see what kind of experience you will have with account obstruction. So first, you remember the confused user with the seed phrase. And now see this user, he's sitting, he's relaxed. He can use his face ID in order to sign transactions. That's very comforting, right? Uh, and this mobile will sign the transactions for him with a different signature scheme. You can have multi-signer. Multi-signer enables, for example, a shared account between multiple parties where all parties need to sign each transaction in the account. That's useful for organizations, for example. And you can also have better security in your own account where you have for example, two different signers, uh, your own signers, a Google signer and, let's say, a, a mobile phone signer. And then if one of them is compromised, you won't, uh, your funds won't be stolen because you have another signature that is required. Another thing you can do with multi-signer is fraud detection. So here you can see a malicious party, a malicious uh, actor, stealing your seed phrase. And then this actor is trying to make a very big transfer from your account to his account. But since we allow multi-signer, you can have a fraud detector that is required to sign each transaction in your account. And this fraud detector can detect a suspicious, a suspicious activity in your account and then call you or send you an email and ask for your approval uh, of this suspicious transaction. Uh, the last example is for gamers. Do we have any gamers here? Oh, we have. Thank you. So this, uh, this gaming exp experience uh, can be dangerous. For example, there might be a monster running towards you one moment and you really need to fight it. And if you're playing with your friend, you may want to pass him your sword because he doesn't have any weapons. And if, you will fight if you're fighting together, you have a better chance to kill the monster. But now you get this annoying pop-up saying that you must sign a transfer of your sword to someone else. And you need to verify some parameters. This is very annoying, right? You just, the, the monster is running towards you. You can't spend some time in approving the transaction right now. So session keys en uh, enables you to delegate the signing task to someone else while you are playing. So you can play peacefully and then later on you will get uh, uh, your signing, uh, you will be the only signer again. And you can limit the signing for weapons only or something like that. Okay, so we saw all these nice things we can do with, with account abstractions. And of course, there are other great ideas. And uh, these, like, these, these uh, features will bring better accessibility and approachability to blockchain in general, and then will bring to wider adoption of blockchains. Okay, so now that we saw how amazing account obstruction is, I'm going to show you two implementations of account obstruction. 
One was done by Ethereum, and this is called EIP4337. And the second one was done on Starknet, and it's called Native Smart Accounts. And that's what we did, and I'm going to explain why you would chose it the way we did. So EIP4337 has a few main goals. The first goal is, well, to have account abstraction. So users will be able to use smart contract wallets. And they won't have to um, have an EOA at all. The second goal is that these users will have the same guarantees that they would have got if they used EOAs. So we want to keep the same de decentralization uh, even if we're adding another layer on top of Ethereum. And the last goal is that we w don't want to make any changes to the Ethereum consensus layer since Ethereum is going through some changes anyway and we don't want to burden the network with more changes. Okay, so this is how it works. Uh, uh, that's a very basic diagram. Uh, but that's like that's the high in high level how it works. Users are sending user operations to a new mempool, a user operation mempool, and we have a new role in the protocol. This role is called bundler, and the bundler is taking uh, user operations from the mempool and bundling them into a bundle. This bundle is sent as a transaction to Ethereum to a new contract called the entry point contract. And this contract will go, go over all the operations in the bundle. First, it will validate that each operation is uh, valid in terms of the signature. It will validate its signature. It will validate that there is enough uh, funds in the account to pay for fees. And then if the validate function passed, it will execute the operation that the user requested. Okay, another thing you can do well, with the IP uh, 437 is called Paymaster. Paymaster enables paying fees with a different token than the Ether token. So in fact, the Paymaster is a service provider. It deploys a smart contract that is going to pay fees for users. It needs to make sure it has enough funds uh, all the time to uh, fund the user's fees. And then the paymaster pays the fees in Ether for, uh, for the user. And the user will pay back after execution in a different token that he owns, for example, USDC. So this way, users don't have to hold Ether in their account when they're doing operations. Uh, something to note here uh, is that the bundler in this scheme is exposed to DOS attack, and this can be performed by both the user and the paymaster. The way it, uh, the attack works is like this. The bundler, before it inserts the operation into a bundle, it needs to simulate the validate function and see if it's going to pass. If it's not going to pass, then anyway, the bundler is going to take to uh, throw this, this operation because he doesn't want to uh, put it in the blockchain, he's not gonna get paid for it. If simulation passed, then the bundler will put the operation into the mempool. Then the operation is inserted into a block. Now there's a real-time validation on the blockchain and this validation can fail although the simulation passed before. This can happen if the validation re is reading from some external storage, for example, and then storage has changed. And then the bundler is not getting paid, but he did some work, so it's not fair, right? So EIP 437 solves this, uh, or can I say reduces this attack by putting some limitations on the validation function but I won't get into it right now. You can talk to me afterwards if, it's, um, if you're curious about it, about it. So now I'm going to show you what we did on Starknet. What we did on Starknet is uh, 
account obstruction that is baked into the protocol. It's one of our architecture decisions. And it's called native smart account because it is native in the protocol. So in StarkNet, we have every account is a contract. That's the only type of account we have. We don't have EOAs at all. The signature in the transaction, the signature field, is a flexible field. It can contain any type of transaction. And the sender address is the account contract address. It doesn't correspond to your uh, private, to your public key in any way. The account contract structure has two main functions. It has the validate function. That's very similar to the EIP of Ethereum that we saw earlier. It has the validate function. This function verifies the account signature, and this can be any type of signature. And it has the execute function, which executes the operation that the user wanted to execute. And this can also be a multi-call. So now I want to compare the two solutions and explain why we chose to implement native smart accounts. Here we see the three features that account abstraction offers. Fee abstraction, non-subtraction, and signature abstraction. These three are all supported by the two solution, although, as a side note, on StarCat we haven't implemented the fee and non-subtraction yet, but it will be existent in future versions. But basically, the architecture, uh, architecture supports the three features. Then I want to talk to you about the bundlers. So EIP4337 adds the bundler role into the protocol. Now, this requires additional infrastructure and tooling just for that. While in StarkNet, we don't have this role, so it doesn't require anything in addition to the basic tooling we have. And then there's also the financial risk. As I discussed earlier, uh, the bundler is exposed to some DOS attacks. So it, the bundler is taking the risk that the state will be different when he's submitting the, the transaction, and some operations may fail and you won't get paid. Now there's legacy EOA. So in Ethereum, all the wallets and applications need to support both EOAs and account obstruction. While on StarkNet, there's only account obstruction. That's the first class citizen of StarkNet, so only smart accounts are supported. And there's the cost. Uh, so naturally, the layer one costs are higher than the layer two costs. So account obstruction will be costly on layer one on Ethereum, which means that some users may decide to stick to the EOAs after all, because they don't want to pay more. While on StarkNet, since it's a layer two, and there's about 100x reduction in cost, the price for uh, account obstruction is negligible. So users, well, they have to use it, but they won't feel the uh, difference in the pricing. And they will get the improved user experience. Okay, so finally, I want to show you three real-world StarkNet applications that we have today on StarkNet. And this will show you that it's very easy and useful and practical to implement uh, all kinds of new features using StarkNet native smart accounts. First, we have the Bravos wallet, which supports the hardware signer of the mobile. If you remember the relaxed man that is using the face ID in order to sign transactions, that's what Bravos have, has implemented. So Bravos has three layers of security. There's the seed phrase signer, and there's the hardware signer, which uh, requires the person signing to have both the mobile and his face ID, so that's two-factor authentication. And you can also decide to have an account with an increased security with two signers, both the seed phrase signer and the hardware signer. So this is uh, better if you have a large amount of funds. 
The second uh, real-world implementation is the Argent wallet. Argent implemented a guardian to their wallet. So each user that chooses to have a guardian will have a second signer to his account. The, guardi the guardian will monitor the transactions that are happening in the user account. And if anything bad happens, it will stop signing and say, uh, tell the user, or send him an email and tell him that something bad happened and he needs to approve this suspicious transaction. Now you can say, hey, this guardian can censor transactions and just not sign them, but that's okay because the user can always remove a bad guardian from his account. It just takes a seven day security period. The third and last example is Visa recurring payments. So if you remember poor Alice who wanted to watch her uh, TV show on Netflix and couldn't pay for her subscription in the mountains, now she can do it with recurring payments without being connected to the internet. So in this scheme, we have Alice's account uh, on the left side, and Alice's account uh, gives, has a white list uh, of contracts that it approve, it always approves uh, requests that get from these contracts. Okay, and the auto payment contract is a, the recurring payments contract from Netflix. Now every month, Netflix will activate uh, will initiate a request from the auto payment contracts to ask Alice's account to make transfer to Netflix. And Alice's account will approve this transaction because um, it, the auto payment account is in the whitelist. So this way, Alice is happy. She can binge Emily in Paris and see if Emily finally chose Gabriel or Al Alfie and she is happy and she can go hiking. So to summarize, what we've seen today is that account obstruction is going to make a huge difference. It has different, it has all kinds of features. For example, different signature schemes. Multi signer, which offers better security. Mobile signer, which adds better UX. And other great features like fraud detection, session keys, recurring payments, and tons of other ideas you probably thought of a few right now. And I showed you three real world applications, Bravos, Argent, and Visa, that show that this is very practical and use, uh, useful right now. All of this will bring to a better world and improved experience of blockchain and eventually to wider adoption. I invite you all to try it on StarkNet. And uh, if you do, please contact me and let me know how it was. Thank you. Thank you.